Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. It is great to be with you all again on today's episode. I'm pleased to have my guest that's on a very special program, Matt Smith. He's responsible for managing existing relationships while generating new opportunities on a national basis with Catholic institutions, service providers, startup businesses, and Catholic ministries. Matt is a native of Fort Wayne, Indiana. He came to the OSV Institute from Fort Wayne-based University of St. Francis, which he joined as a professor in 2002. His responsibilities at the university increased in scope with his initial appointment at the university's director of writing, followed by department chair, director of general education, dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and vice president of institutional advancement. He helped secure more than 33 million in grants and gifts to the university. And he is the, he's the director of strategic alliances for the OSV Institute for Catholic Innovation. Matt, how are you doing today? Doing great, William. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on and to talk about what you all are doing over at OSV with this challenge. Very excited to share this with your listeners today. I think um, many of them will be uh, interested in what we're doing and, and maybe be able to take part in our challenge. I hope, I hope so. And I, as we as I mentioned off air, a lot of my listeners, they're somewhere in the beginning stages of forming apostolates and Catholic organizations to evangelize. So I think this will be helpful to them to see what's out there. So I'm, I'm pleased to have you on. So thanks again. Now, what originally sparked the idea for the OSV challenge and why now? Yeah, that's a great question, William. And, and I give you a little bit of history of the Institute because I think that'll shape um, how, you know, what we're doing now. So um, OSV, most of your listeners probably know us through you know, church envelopes, curriculum, uh, our trade books, um, you know, a lot of different things. It was founded in, in 1912 by Archbishop Knoll. Um, at that time, Monsignor Knoll. Uh, but he bought a printing press for a dollar and started the OSB newspaper, which increased exponentially in, in circulation. And as that grew, um, we diversified into many different things, you know, talking about some of the, the forward facing of the trade books, the curriculum, those kind of things. Um, but we also do a lot of parish services, diocesan services behind the scenes, fundraising help, uh, parish management systems, things like that. Right. Um, in 1915, he began the Institute. Archbishop Knoll thought any, any money that OSV made should go back to the church in the North America. And so the Institute has been giving out grants uh, since 1915 and, you know, to, to many different apostolates, many different programs, diocesan, uh, diocesan efforts, parishes, those kind of things. Um, about three years ago, four years ago, uh, OSV hired Jason Shanks as our president of the Institute. And he spent about a year doing fact-finding uh, kind of trying to get the pulse of the church, doing a lot of research as we thought about our grant-making initiatives. Um, and he, he um, went through um, a really sort of rigorous process to come up with three initiatives that OSV Institute funded. And that was around millennials, around the growing Hispanic population in the church, and then with the domestic church. Um, and so for the last two and a half years, three years, we have funded those initiatives through a, a fairly traditional grant uh, process really great, funded a lot of great organizations, doing a lot of great work. Last year in 2020, um, we saw a, a need or wanted to spark a, a sort of catalyst for innovation in the church. And so we began the innovation challenge uh, last year. We had about 350 applicants uh, down to 12 finalists and then three winners of $100,000 prizes. And one of the things that we did um, during that time period was do some assessment of our traditional grant making and our, our, our challenge winners, our challenge finalists. And through some of that assessment, what we saw was we thought that the Institute could have uh, a greater impact on the life of the church through being a catalyst for innovation. And so what we kind of did with the 2021 uh, innovation challenge was, uh, I would say, double down on that, increased okay. our funding towards uh, uh, the challenge. Um, not only in the innovation challenge, but also through, we rebranded ourselves in January as the OSV Institute for Catholic Innovation. We have uh, launched OSV Talks, which are Catholic TED Talks. If your readers aren't familiar with the, or your listeners aren't familiar with those, it's something they might want to check out. Some great 18-minute uh, uh, talks from leaders in the church, just about different innovative 
uh, ideas, innovative problems, innovative talks, I guess they're not innovative problems, but solutions to problems, innovative sure. solutions. Um, and, and so the challenge this year, um, again, we doubled down a little bit. One of the feedback we got from our, our finalists and semifinals last year was, you know, as we went along the process, was there any way that we could do some seed funding to help those apostolates, help those ministries or whatever programs? So our 25 semifinalists are going to receive some prize money if they reach that stage. Our finalists will receive another a um, uh, little bit upped uh, level of funding as they get to that stage. And then, our, again, the, the winners will receive three $100,000 prizes. So three winners, $100,000 each. And it truly is prize money. Wow. That's Thank a long-winded answer to a very simple question. No, it's okay. No, great. So three finalists. And, of course, this is the second year for the contest. Um, can you give us maybe some background on the three – on the three winners from last year and maybe what they're up to? Sure. And so our three winners last year uh, were the Domestic Church pro uh, Project, uh, Eden Invitation, and then the Juan Diego Network. And so um, not only with our these finalists, I mean, the $100,000 certainly was a capital infusion that has helped them, um, you know, scale up a little bit. And all right. three of them have had success with that, able whatever their, their, their ministry is or whatever their project is, they've been able to scale up with the use of those funds. Um, but what we've also done with our other nine finalists in those three uh, winners, um, we've also worked with them in terms of PR. They've been uh, all of those finalists have been getting uh, um, sort of put out in front of through our newspaper, through our media outlets. Others have picked them up, Alatea, things like that. So Great. more exposure, broad exposure. The other thing, William, that we really wanted to do was um, not only build this innovative tribe, so innovation, not only just winners, uh, finalists and things like this, but a whole tribe of innovation. What we're also trying to bring to the table are investors, foundations, individual philanthropists. So last year of the 12 finalists, they were probably a split six and six nonprofit, for profit. So you had some of the finalists were looking for, you know, philanthropists, donors, those kind of things. But others were looking for equity investment or venture capital. And so we've tried to work uh, with different entities to bring those to the table. So sort of we have two strategies as we're, we're focusing on this year. It's building that investor tribe in the church. All the creatives, whether they be in creative arts, whether they be in technology, whether they be in uh, parish ministry, diocesan ministry, um, whatever those kind of things, very broad swath. But we're also trying to be... Um, um, sort of connectors with philanthropists and foundations. One of the things that we also found over our time uh, sort of studying innovation and how we could help catalyze that was that many other foundations and philanthropists were thinking about the same things. How can we have impact? How can we start up? And, and you know, you, to go back to an earlier point that you made, William, was why now? Hmm. You know, the Catholic Church has a long heritage and history of being innovators. Um, and, you know, um, you can think about hospitals, you can think about Catholic schools, you can Absolutely. think about social services, you can think about science. Many Catholics aren't aware that many scientists and many of the scientific uh, discoveries and, 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 and uh, expansion of scientific thought were Catholic priests, were Catholic sisters, mm -hmm. uh, were Catholics. And so, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to claim that back, and I really want to uh, channel the presidents uh, of the Institute's words in, you know, the church needs to go on the offensive. And that means that really to show people the truth and beauty of the church and that we are innovators and things like this. We, you know, I think sometimes we get defensive about the Catholic church and sometimes for reasons in the last few years, especially, but really to, to we want to be that catalyst for innovation. And we also want to be that connector for other philanthropists, for other foundations that are looking for ways to have a profound impact to bring people to the truth and beauty of Christ. Okay. Now, what can, what can one expect with the process when they apply? Well, the first place to go to is the osvchallenge.com. That's the website site. So osvchallenge.com. That's where the application can be found. But we also have you know, an FAQ uh, uh, page where people can, maybe some of their questions can be answered in that. We have a timeline so people can sort of think about, you know, many of the are folks that are innovators and entrepreneurs, you know, quote unquote, have day jobs or they're um, raising their family or 
you know, lots of other things going on in their lives. So we want to make sure that people understand the sort of time commitment as you go forward. And so, you know, there, there's all that kind of ancillary material that people can, can discern if, if it's the right time for them to apply. Um, and then going through the application, the first round of application, it's a fairly simple application that just help ha ask them to describe their idea, ask them to talk a little bit and not in a very in-depth way, but just to give a general idea of a market analysis. Why is their idea, so, what problem is it solving? What do they know about that, that problem? Those kind of things. But we're also really interested in the people that are applying. I mean, we really want to get people that um, have grit um, because I think, William, as you know, when you're starting something new, uh, going on a new endeavor, uh, there's going to be many iterations of that. You're going to hit walls, you're going to fail. Right. And, and we want people that you know, can talk about how have they overcome challenges, um, what is their capacity of, uh, and passion for this idea. So that's the first round. It, so they have from the application process opened up in early February, they have till April 2nd to apply. Um, so, you know, a fairly long time in there. If they make it into round two, there will be some more questions asked. There'll be a pitch video um, that will ask them to upload a very simple pitch video um, and some things around what we call what is called a business canvas, just to get an idea of, of what they are. And I, I do want to tell your listeners also that, you know, based on last year's applicants and last year's finalists, I mean, we had everything from people literally that were starting with a back of the napkin idea. I mean, literally um, to people that maybe were in a little bit further evolution of their ideas in terms of, um, you know, maybe they had their, their nonprofit or their LLC formed and maybe they were just starting those kind of things. But we've also had people apply that came from what I would say very established uh, institutions but there's a program or something new that they wanted to start within that institution. Okay. And that is fine too. Um, you know, we would, if they make it past the first round, we would talk about delineating between what that sort of evolved or established institution is and what the, um, what the new idea or new program or new uh, strategy might be. But, you know, all those things, like I said, we really, I mean, the heart of this is, we want to cast the net wide. We're really looking for those innovative ideas in the church. Yeah. So just to clarify, if someone is working for, if they have an organization right now and they, they want a new idea, they could, they could pitch this new idea, but not, they can't try to get funding for the existing organization that's already happening then, right? That's exactly right, William. Okay. That's a great description of that. So the funding, the prize money couldn't go into sort of direct operating expenses for that entity or, okay. you know, those kind of things. It really is funding the new idea. And that may be around personnel, that may be around product, that may be around technology. I mean, you know, we funded a lot of different things through the prize money last year, um, kind of all of the above, um, but it can't, it can't go into that existing entity. Got it. Okay. Now, is there any areas um, of special interest that that is being focused on this year? Um, no, and and we, I mean, that's a that's a good question because we talked about that. We talked about should we focus and have you know areas around X, Y, or Z where that's what we want to focus on. But we thought at least for the second year, and again, we're we're trying to live out our values of you know innovation to sort of reiteration and collaboration and getting feedback and all those kind of things, we decided to, to again, do the broad swap, um, you know, and, and really see what we got in those kind of things. Um, you know, there is a possibility in the future, we, maybe we will focus on in innovation in a certain area, or those kind of things. But right now, we really want to keep seeing it, it because, it, again, because this is organic and it comes, um, it can come from any level. It can come from a concerned group of, of citizens, people can come from a diocesan office, a school, a postulate, those kind of things. We also feel we'll get a sense of, you know, where are areas in the church that are crying out for innovation? Um, you know, for example, maybe we'll get 75 applications around K through 12 education. Well, maybe that's an area then as we think about where we want to focus our funds, where we want to focus a challenge, where we want to maybe connect other philanthropists to Maybe that's the area, but right now it really is, you know, anything and everything um, at this point. Okay. So how does the Always V Institute connect these applicants with, like you said, a philanthropist and investors? 
So a couple different ways, William. One of the ways is if, if people make it to the semifinal stage this year, and it'll be 20, about 25 organizations will be selected or people will be selected that way. They're going to go through a six-week accelerator. Um, last year, we did a 10-week accelerator. This year, we're doing a, we shortened it a little bit based on some feedback we got. And part of that is we bring in folks to talk as they're going through the accelerator. Sometimes it's philanthropists, so we bring them in to talk about how do you get in a foundation's door? How do you, I mean, what's the, uh, we bring in uh, some of our partners in uh, the philanthropic world who can talk about what happens in a donor meeting. You know, some of our, some of our um, applicants had never asked anybody for money. Right. Or if you are doing equity investment or looking for venture capital, how do you go about that? So part of that is, you know, part of that is we, we do some education, uh, especially de depending on, you know, what's the mix of the 25 that we get. The other thing that we do is when we do our demo day in September, we are hopeful to have a physical demo day uh, along with live streaming. Last year was all virtual because of COVID, which, which worked out fine. Again, it taught us a lot about pivoting and being able to be nimble. Uh, but, uh, um, but, uh, um, but this year we do hope to have a physical uh, demo day. At that demo day, the, the uh, finalists will make a pitch to judging panel for the finalists. But we're also hopeful, um, and what we had planned for last year was to have some time for each of the finalists to make a pitch to investors, philanthropists. Um, we hope to have physically some of them there, but also to do a live streaming so that folks can come in. Um, and so what we're hoping to do with these 12 finalists is to get them in front of these folks at that demo day. That education is huge because there's a big difference between presenting venture capital and philanthropy. So I think in addition to the contest, I think providing the education is a huge thing that you're doing. And well, and I think it's, you know, it's really important to, you know, uh, these, a lot of these folks and even in, in, you know, these, this year talking to some of the, the contestants that are applying the challenges that are applying great ideas. And they're very passionate. I mean, they want to serve the church, help the church serve, you know, people serve the world. Um, and, and some of them have different skill sets. Some of them really understand what does it mean if you want to be a nonprofit? What do you want to be if you're for profit? But, you know, how do you build a business plan? How do you build a marketing plan? Um, and so we really try, and again, it's not, you're not getting an MBA, but, you know, what we're trying to do is help people understand the different aspects of that and then also connect them. One, it's to build that, you um, uh, innovative tribe. So one of the things that we found and that we really are going to be uh, uh, very much curating this year is those 12 finalists really started to support each other. And so would point the point each other and support each other. And we had some folks that were really excellent in technology. They helped some of the, the groups that maybe weren't so um, sophisticated in that build their websites, things like that. So it's building that where those shared resources, I mean, one of the values of the challenge is collaboration. And I think we really want to try to get um, um, many of our Catholic brothers and sisters out of silos, um, you know, to collaborate. How can we serve the church? You know, because William, I think, I think everybody knows, and I think everybody's seen the data about the, you know, sort of the numbers of people leaving the church or the numbers of people not even beginning in the church. And, you know, it, it's not that we want to change doctrine and everything we do is from the heart of the church and within the magisterium, but it's really like, like I indicated earlier, it's to go on the offensive. It's to show the world the truth and beauty and just the passion of the, of the church and what it can do and help to transform lives. I mean, I think that I always think of St. Francis's famous line about the gospel, and I'm probably going to not paraphrase it exactly right, but you know, every day you should preach the gospel. And if you have to use words, I mean, it really is about living out the gospel message. Absolutely. Now the application process began on, it opened up on February 1st. And can you tell us where, when it ends and maybe when the prize, when, when the prize would be awarded later on? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so round one applications uh, will be due April 2nd, but we're accepting them through and we will we're sort of having a rolling um you know uh, uh, rolling moving on so we're you know we're trying so it's on april 2nd we don't have to read you know hopefully 500 applications you know right on april 2nd so you know but people will have till april 2nd to apply 
Um, and, you know, the, on that timeline, there are dates for each of them, but it culminates in a September 18th demo day. Um, so that's where the, the winners will be announced and, and you know, the, uh, we'll have the finalists doing their pitches for the judges and then um, some connection time with investors and philanthropists. Okay, great. So September 18th is when everything will be announced. Now, how, how many applicants have you received so far? Um, we are close to about 80 or 90. And so that's, you know, about three weeks in, four Great. weeks in. Um, again, you know, another month, another, you know, whole month. And, um, you know, by the volume of questions, uh, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we'll have more. Like I said, last year, we, have a, we had about 350. We'd love to hit that again. Um, and so really encourage your listeners if they have an idea. There's also, if people have questions, because sometimes there's legal and technical questions or just need some affirmation to go ahead and apply. There's a number of places on that osvchallenge.com where they can submit questions and we'll get back to them as quickly as we can. All right, everyone. So check out osvchallenge.com. If you have a great idea, submit it. I mean, anything we can do to help the church and bring souls to our Lord. So uh, Matt, I thank you for coming on and talking about the challenge and I appreciate all you're doing with it. Thank you very much. Well, again, thank you for having me, William. And, you know, if you want to check in in May or June or something and see how we're doing with the challenge, we'd be happy to talk about that too. And maybe have even a, you know, one of our semifinalists or finalists on with you. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. I look forward to that. I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We well, have a great day. Thank you. God thank bless. you, William.